before I go over there, I want to say that I am so honored to be here with all of you. And Rick and I salute all of you. You are the best of the best. And I'm so, I'm really, thank you so much for inviting me to come. Okay, I'm going to go, oops. Oops. I hope I don't Got fall. It. Okay. You're going to be okay. <laughs> There was no body, there were no ashes. However, the coroner's office kept in touch with me and also Morgan Stanley. And after a few weeks, they did find something that came from Rick's desk. He always put his wallet in his drawer. They found Rick's charred military card. He had only received his new card the week before and I had gone with him to receive mine for the first time. I eventually donated Rick's military card to the museum, the National Army Infantry Museum in Fort Benning, along with all of the other pieces of, of memorabilia for Rick. I know when you honored my husband, Rick, two years ago, you all referred to him, as all of the soldiers have, as hardcore. And indeed, he was and will always be known as an incredible soldier who always went above and beyond the call of duty on the fields of the Idrang and on 9-11. And this evening, I would like to share with you another side of Rick. And it is about the heart of a soldier, like all of you. My husband was a writer, a poet, an artist. He loved sculpture and he loved to write. Whether it was plays or poems or attempting to write his own book about soldiers. After 9-11, I found so many pieces of Rick's writing which he had stuffed into the upper shelves of our kitchen cabinets. The weeks before 9-11, Rick was getting up in the middle of the night and writing. In looking through what he was writing, it was about the experience of being a soldier, and this is what he wrote. Heroic acts tend to gather around soldiers, perhaps stirred up on the cries for patriotic duty and encouraged by pretty ribbons and medals. Rick was, a very kind, was very kind and went out of his way to help others, a man of the universe, a true Renaissance man. He also loved the American bald eagles. He brought me to the Rapture Trust in Millington, New Jersey, when he wanted to introduce me to two of his friends, <laughs> the eagles, Treader and Uno. Uno had one eye and the other had one wing. The trust is an incredible place and I'm so happy to live near this trust as I often visit it and always feel that Rick's presence is close to me. Rick and I met in August 23 years ago. He was jogging barefoot and was walking, I was walking my dog, Buddy. I stopped and he, as he passed and said, I said to him, why are you walking barefoot? And he said he wanted to know what it felt like to walk in Rhodesia, recounting his service there and went on jogging. A few days later, he drove by and asked me to have breakfast with him. I said I had to continue taking my dog Buddy, but I invited him to have coffee on my patio. After talking for hours, he had to leave to go to New York, and he said to me, we are going to be friends forever. He called the day afterwards, and we made plans to go to the Pennsylvania countryside. The first thing that Rick asked me was, what are you about? And I replied, what do you mean? And he said, well, when I was very young, I decided what I wanted to do with my life, and I knew if I stayed on that path that at the end of my life, I would have accomplished everything I set out to do, and he certainly did. We never stopped seeing each other. We sold our townhouses and bought a place together, and in February, we were married in St. Augustine, Florida, with his two best friends and their spouses in front of an old fort in front of the ocean, and in the spring, we honeymooned in Hale, Cornwall, the United Kingdom, where Rick was born. He wanted me to meet his mother and his relatives and friends. The area was so beautiful, and he wanted me to see all of it. He took me up to the side of a steep hill with lots of stones to the very top. It looked all over Cornwall, and there he said, if something happens to me, I want you to take my ashes and bring them here and strew them in the valley. The following year, Rick wanted to return to Cornwall again. He wanted to renew our wedding vows. 
at an ancient church in a nearby village where we'd been before. The church was filled, and so Rick and I went back up the hill overlooking the church and the beautiful water. He did not have anything written down. He just stood there and recited these words, which I will read to you. And when we returned home, he had it framed, and I still have it hanging on my wall. We, Richard Rescorla and Susan Rescorla, husband and wife, lovers and companions, travelers from across the sea, have been blown by a sacred wind to this old Norman church. Standing in this holy garden, we affirm our wedding vows in the presence of our Celtic ancestors who sleep in peace in the graveyard and the sand dunes nearby. We perform this ceremony with all humility, knowing that we do not stand an inch higher than the lowest, the lowest of God's creatures. As we confirm our love for each other, we also, write, we also unite two divine rivers of thought. The faith in a great creator is bonded to the belief in this, in this, in this ceremony of the spheres. Many are, many are lives May our life, may our, I'm sorry, may our love be renewed each day, shining as bright as the beautiful stained glass windows of this church. At this moment, we feel the wonder of nature, a sense of unity with the earth, the sky, and the sea, the leeching-covered rocks. Songbirds sang on the branches above us. We hear the music of a robin calling for her mate. The blossoming hawthorn tree nearby reminds us of natural and orderly course of time. We are aware that our time on earth is brief. The footprints that we make in the sandy, and in the sandy soil will one day be washed away by an eternal tide. Our souls will then go forth arm in arm in an everlasting journey. As the mist rises above the river, we hold hands and count our blessings. We ask the pink and white wildflowers that are surround us and every leaf of grass to witness our vows and celebrate our happiness. We give ourselves to each other for all eternity, for better or worse, sickness and health, and in this instance, seek the blessings of a merciful God. And that was at St. Eunice Church in Lelant in, in Cornwall, right near where Rick was born. Our lives together were wonderful. Every weekend, we drove to Pennsylvania to enjoy the, art, the area, the artists, the sculptures, and people. The last few days of his life, Rick was telling me that if something happened sh should happen to him, he would like me to take his ashes to Cornwall. But now he changed his mind and asked me, if something happens to me, will you memorialize the, memorialize the cage at the Raptor Trust? That's where the eagles were housed that he loved so much. And on that day when we arrived home, I immediately wrote down what Rick wanted me to do, including a special inscription, which is now at the Raptor Trust. In loving memory of my sweetheart, my soulmate forever, my Celtic hero in life, and our hero in death, Richard C. Rescorla, May 27, 1939. Just like the eagles, you have spread your wings and soared into eternity. In the months before 9-11, I knew Rick had a lot on his mind. All of the weekend drives we went together, he would repeat these words to me. You'll remember me in the petal of a flower, in the life, life, I'm sorry, a, le le a leaf of a tree, and in the ripple of the water. I kept asking him why he was saying these things to me, but I know now he was preparing me for what he knew would happen. About a week or so later on 9-11, Rick left work as usual, and when he arrived, he called me at the same time he always did. A short time later, his friend Dan Hill called me to turn on the television, informing me that a plane had already hit one of the towers. I later learned that immediately after the North Tower was struck, Rick sprung into action to lead the evacuation of Morgan Stanley employees from the South Tower. As he was doing so, Rick kept his people calm, singing Cornish songs and reminding them, today is a day to be proud to be an American. Tomorrow the world will be looking at you. It seemed like a short time after Rick did tell me, I want you to know, he, he said, stop crying, I have to get my people out. If something happens to me, I want you to know you made my life. 
And I, in tears, said the same to him, and I fulfilled all that Rick had asked me to do. We had a small service at the Raptor Trust with bagpipers and Cornish songs and excerpts of Rick's favorite poems and the American flag. Rick's son Trevor read an excerpt from one of Rick's favorite books, and at the end of the service, Rick's son and his medic, Joseph Holloway, took two, wo two wounded and now recovered birds to a field at the trust and let them fly free. An American flag flies at the trust. There is a small garden in front and a bench to sit down or for to ponder and pray and listen to all with a third ear and said to myself that I would fulfill all that Rick wanted me to do, knowing that I would never see him again. I am always here to listen. I'm always here to listen because you, like Rick, all have the heart of a soldier. I hope that you keep Rick's memory alive and share his story with your family and friends and communities. And may we never forget 9-11 and all the heroes on that day. God bless all of you and God bless America. I echo Susan. Okay, God bless all of you. Uh, and I am so thankful and grateful on behalf of my family for all the service that you put in and your dedication. And I guess I'll take you through a little timeline on my experiences with Rick. Um, I'm from Yonkers, New York originally, and I've worked now for Morgan Stanley for the last 26 years. When I first was transferred to the World Trade Center, I remember, I think it was day two, we had training. And training was run by Rick. And I will tell you a couple things about Rick. When Rick spoke, you listened. Because he had a voice you could hear from the mountains. And if you did not pay attention in training, Rick would make you pay attention in training. Because his voice was just so commanding and so amazing that you felt compelled to listen to him. And all of the training that he gave us was for a reason. And his heroism to me began long before September 11th. Rick was a visionary and he knew based on his experiences, particularly after the bombing, that there could be a day where we are attacked in this building and it, we're gonna have to mobilize and get people out. And I think he learned a lot from the bombing and what to do and how to get people effectively out quicker. And what's amazing to me is instinctively, we knew what to do because of Rick's training when we heard about the first plane hitting building one that we just immediately evacuated. And not only did we evacuate, we took the stairwell uh, instead of the elevators because we knew that that would be the correct course of action. When we got to the 50th floor, I remember they came across and said, building one has been hit by an aircraft, building two is secure. I can tell you because of Rick's training, there was no way I was going back upstairs. Rick had put in your mind, if something happens, you leave this building. And that's exactly the advice that I gave the folks that I was with. And as we continued to go down the stairwell, lo and behold, about a minute later, we got hit. The Trade Center moved almost like a pendulum from side to side. You felt like you were going to fall out. Um, but you kept going downstairs. And it was amazing to me how orderly and, 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 and just how calm people were. Um, we got to the eighth floor observatory deck. And I'm pretty sure as we were going down the escalator, in fact, I know for sure because I, I heard him singing, I could hear Rick going the other direction. And to me, that's what epitomized Rick. While others were leaving because of his direction and training and doing exactly what he wanted, he was going back in to get anyone else he could out of that building. And to me, that he exemplified to me that day leadership, discipline, focus, compassion, any word you want to put onto that. 
for what he did going back into the building. He's a true American hero to me. I'm going to tell you three stories about 9-11, about but they're all really the same story. Uh, and you'll kind of hear uh, echoes of what they've early said today, too. So my story is a little different. On that day, I was a company commander in the 101st Airborne Division, about six years in the Army, and it had been a really, really quiet six years. Uh, lots of training, no operations, just doing my job. That was okay. I was enjoying what I was doing. I was about to go to graduate school the next year to go be a West Point instructor. Kind of looking forward to that. And right now, I'm looking forward to getting my company ready to go to the Joint Readiness Training Center at Fort Polk, Louisiana, deploying about two weeks from 9-11. From uh, we had a company training meeting, and we walked into a closed-door meeting. I was already in there. Just when we were about to start, an NCO walked in and said, hey, I just heard on the radio a plane hit the World Trade Center. So, I thought, thinking back to the 50s when a, uh, a bomber hit the Empire State Building, it was foggy, probably a small prop plane at the World Trade Center, not a big deal, let's do our meeting. So it wasn't until about half an hour later when we came out of our closed door meeting, I think everyone in the building forgot we were in there, uh, we realized it was a whole lot different. By then, the other plane had hit the, uh, uh, the towers and we knew that things were really gonna be bad. And then we watched in real time as the other plane hit the Pentagon and Clearly at this point, not an accident. Clearly it was terrorism, although we didn't really know a lot. We'd heard about Al-Qaeda. We'd been briefed earlier, a couple weeks ago, about the USS Cole bombing uh, over in the Middle East uh, the year before, and how Al-Qaeda was the prime suspect for that. But at that point, responsibility wasn't important. New York was a thousand miles away, not close to Fort Campbell, but it might as well been Nashville, 45 miles away. If our nation's financial and military centers could be attacked, then we were also vulnerable on a base. Being on a military base made us much more vulnerable, but also much more able to respond so uh, we could protect ourselves. So the entire installation immediately went into unprecedented force protection measures. I spent the, in my whole day getting my company, the brigade area, and everywhere else fully secured, uh, getting our folks out, putting wire out, everything that the base told us to do to make sure that we wouldn't be a target for the future. It was truly an exhausting day. And while I recall hearing about the fourth plane that went down in Pennsylvania, it didn't really register that much. Clearly it was part of the attack as well, but wasn't successful, you didn't know why. The fog of war, lack of information, disinformation, uh, just I didn't have a lot about what was going on. And I didn't know at that point that my cousin was on that plane. It wasn't until I drove home eight or nine o'clock that night through Contratina Wire, past a you know, triple security uh, front gate at Fort Campbell, that I finally listened to my, my voicemail. My father had called me uh, three or four times that day, and each time I'd ignored the phone call uh, because I was really busy, and I, I knew that he knew I was in Tennessee and not in New York, Pennsylvania, or, or Washington, D.C., so that I was safe. So as I got home, as I went home, listened to my voicemail that said, uh, you know, hey, hope you're okay. I uh, hope you had a, you're not too, too busy and everything, and oh, by the way, your cousin Richard was on Flight 93, um, which was, was really, you know, at that point, made me really stop and think. So I thought, who is Richard? You know, I hadn't seen him in 10 or 15 years. He was about 10 years older than him, grew up in New Jersey, where my parents were from, and whenever we'd be back in town in Jersey, I wasn't living there, um, you know, we'd see his family, but didn't see him. He was a, a biologist, had um, worked for Fish and Wildlife as a game warden on um, Delaware, New Jersey, Oregon, and at that point in Washington State, or I mean, I'm saying in California, and he'd been home visiting his grandmother for her 100th birthday party. But I didn't know Richard well. I just kind of knew vaguely what he was doing. Um, and he was always good to us. My older brother had a, had a bio project to uh, watch an animal. Richard brought a meadow vole up from Delaware to our house so we could observe it for a few weeks. It actually died, but that isn't really the point. <laughs> um, but beyond that, I didn't know Richard at all. I just knew he was a law enforcement officer for Fish and Wildlife, serving the government like I was, but in different capacity. Um, but really didn't know much. So over the next few days and weeks, we got information about, about Flight 93. You know, reports of phone calls that were made from people on the plane to family members. Uh, so Richard was uh, a bit of a Luddite. He had a government cell phone that he never ever turned on and never used. So he didn't call anybody, uh, but, but that's not important either. W what's really clear to me is the passengers on that plane to a man and woman knew their plane was headed for somewhere like the Pentagon or the World Trade Center. 
they weren't going to let that happen. So the democratically, they voted to act. And we don't know really what happened after that. They did something, the plane went down, and it did not go down in Washington, D.C. It went down in a, an abandoned strip mine, coal mine in Pennsylvania. No better place for a plane to go down where nobody could be hurt except for the people on the plane, the passengers, and the, and the terrorists. Uh, the folks in that plane save lives. Uh, and they embody the American values. So that's a great story. And I wish I knew more about Richard. You know, I learned more later on. He loved to play guitar. He actually built his own guitars to play. He had a lovely German Shepherd named Raven, a black German Shepherd, an amazing dog, I'm told. Uh, he loved to garden. Kind of a Renaissance man. But, you know, since 9 11, I've been to all the memorials um, involved with the Flight 93 Society and uh, the park there. And, and that place is special. It's uh, been transformed from a strip mine to a 2,000 acre, beautiful, serene, tranquil park. Um, Richard, who loved nature and wildlife, doing it for, his you know, for what he did for a living, would love that we transformed a strip mine into a park, you know, to, to preserve nature, wildlife, and the habitat. So, so that's really amazing. And I know Richard's there, and I know this because I'm gonna take your story from the ID card. Uh, a few weeks after 9-11, uh, an FBI agent, Ed Ryan, who was investigating the Pentagon site, took his motorcycle and drove up to, uh, to Pennsylvania to see the site there because he wanted to see kind of all that had gone on on 9-11. And he was outside the fence line, but he saw this glint um, in, in the fence line. And he asked one of the people who was investigating there to go find out what that was. And um, the, the person went and found it, and it was, a, it was Richard's uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, Law Enforcement badge, still in uh, the leather wallet, a little bit singed, but you know, clear as day it had survived. And, um, that's actually now on display. It was given to the family who gave it back to uh, the park and it's sitting on display in the memorial. But that's how I know Richard loves what's going on there and, and loves uh, you know, what happened to that, that spot. And uh, to me, it's a reminder that 20, 20 years later, we had to remember 9-11. You know, in the beginning I said I was in a training meeting doing my job. After that, we were doing the response for 9-11 from Force Protection at Fort Campbell, doing our job. Rick did his job. The folks in that plane did their job. So, you know, every day in the Army, I, I do my job, and I, I implore all of you, as you move up in the service, you know, to do your job the best you can, because you never know when you're going to have to do a different job that is far more critical uh, to the world. That's all. Thank you.